firm a foundation. I've been reading in uh, Psalms 119 all week and his word is a firm foundation. The Lord is eternal and it stands firm in the heavens. Uh, it says how, how I delight in your law. It's more valuable than gold, fine gold. It is a firm foundation, amen. And the law is what's right on earth. <laughs> Our constitution is so based off of Leviticus and how the Lord wanted society to run. I just, I've been meditating on the law and it's just awesome. How firm a foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his age. Excellent word, what more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and I still I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand Upheld by my gracious, omnipotent hand When through the deep waters I call thee to go And rivers of sorrow shall not overflow for I will be with thee, thy 
trials to bless and in sanctify to thee thy deepest distress when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie thy grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee i only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine e'en down to old age all my people shall prove my sovereign eternal unchangeable love and when silver hair shall her temples adorn like lambs they shall still in my bosom be born the soul that on jesus hath leaned for repose i will not i will not desert to his foes that soul though all hell should endeavor to shake i'll never no never no never forsake amen our next song is a i've always loved it growing up is bless the lord bless the lord on my soul ten thousand reasons before we just sang about Blessings on mine with 10,000 beside. That gives us 10,000 reasons to praise the Lord. It's awesome to uh, it, let me be singing when the evening comes. I just think let me be singing when Jesus comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing till the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul Worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, you're rich in love and you're slow to anger, your name is great and your heart is kind, for all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. I worship his holy name. Sing like never. strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul sings your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul I worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name 
something to look forward to. Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that? Keep playing it, man. Keep playing it. Aren't you thankful for that? How the Lord moves. Man, there's one day it's coming. We're going to sing a new song. It won't be the old song. It'll be a new song that even the angels cannot sing. We're going to be able to stand before him and say, I am redeemed. Praise the Lord for what he does for us. Man, can you long for that day? Can you imagine 10,000? Read now 10,000 years, and it just keeps going, just keeps going, just keeps going. And we get to praise the Lord for how good he's been to us. Man, praise the Lord for these songs this morning. I want us just to gather in around. Gather in around, and we're just going to lift up our prayers and our praises to him that this morning. I'd ask you to just continue to remember David. Jir and his family as his brother passed away yesterday and so you just continue to lift them up and just uh, call out upon the name of the Lord for peace for them as well. And so we're just going to seek the Lord this morning. Man, he is so good to us. He is so good to us. Lord Jesus, I thank you right now for what you have done for us. Lord, we've been able to come in this morning have a wonderful time in Sunday school, to come into service, to be able to sing these songs that we have just sung, talking about how good you are, how much grace you have, what you've done for us, and Lord, what you're going to do for us. And so, Lord, thank you for that. Lord, within us, there is a day that we long that you're going to come back and you're going to take us home. And in that day, we're still going to be singing. In that day, we're still going to be praising you. But Lord, right now, we're here. And so we want to continue to do the same thing here. We want to praise your name just as if you were coming back at this very moment. We want to be found faithful in worshiping you. And so, Lord, I pray, would you just continue to be with us? Lord, this morning, we we heard a lot of prayer requests in our early time and even in Sunday school time. But, Lord, we heard a lot of praises as well. You're answering, how you're moving, how you're speaking, how you're drawing. And, Lord, we thank you for that, that we can pray and you hear us. It doesn't fall on a deaf ear, but, Lord, you hear the cries of your children. And, Lord, we thank you for what you have done for us. We know that you know what's best, and we trust you, Lord. And today we bring everything before you. And we say, Lord, here we are, but here's what's going on. Here's the way the week has been. Here's the way my morning has been. Lord, I lay it out before you. You do with what you see fit to do with this. You know best. Lord, you be with us right now. I pray, Lord, that you just continue to draw us into who you are. Pray, Lord, would you just continue to anoint our time that we have together. Lord, may we not take these moments for granted as the body of Christ worships you together. I thank you, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for how you're moving and how you're speaking. Lord, we continue to trust that you will do just that for us. Touch us, Lord, today. We ask, Lord, for a special blessing, a special outpouring upon each and every one, especially the ones who have lost loved ones. Lord, would you just draw them in close today? Wrap your arms around them. Speak peace into their life as only you can do. Lord, continue to be with us right now. Thank you for this church, for your people. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. And we will continue to give you praise 
The glory and the honor, it is all yours and it's deserved by you and you alone. And we give that to you. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, you're coming back soon for us. Lord, help us to be ready. We want to see your face. We thank you, Jesus, for everything you do for us. We ask it in your name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, what I do dread, what have I to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. If you have your Bibles, if you would, stand and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, a wonderful book of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> we'll just have one verse this morning. Verse 24. It's short. I'll try to be the same. <laughs> Uh, Hebrews 10, 24 says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and 
good works. Lord, thank you for who you are. Lord, we are so thankful that this week, Lord, really, there is no one in here that could have made it throughout the week without leaning on the arms. Lord, the things of this world fail us. <laughs> they don't help us. But Lord Jesus, you are everlasting. And we thank you for that. I pray, Lord, would you just continue to touch us right now. Pray, Lord, that you would touch your word. Lord, your word is true. Your word is good. Your word is faithful. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that your word goes forth today. Not me. Anything that I have say, that I can say, could say, have said, Lord, it's all about you. And Lord, we pray that you continue to move in our midst. And we're going to give you praise for these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. And we all say together, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Here we have in Hebrews chapter 10. Man, Hebrews is a book that's just crammed, packed full, a lot of theology. Uh, not for sure who wrote it. A lot of different scholars say different things. And so, but we look through here and it's, it's really just an amazing book. Here, here's some things, though, that I wonder if you've ever thought about. I, I just wonder. So this morning, maybe just, just think about these things. <clears throat> the first person who ever inhaled helium must have been so relieved when the effects wore off. <laughs> have you ever thought about that? We do it. We know what's going to happen. They didn't. <laughs> oh, man. At special occasions, girls with curly hair straighten it, and girls with straight hair curly, curl it. You ever, you ever thought about some of these things? Just <laughs> the best part of a cucumber tastes like the worst part of a watermelon. You ever thought it? <laughs> now, they, I'm, just, I'm just saying, eat the worst part of a watermelon and then eat a cucumber. See what happens. It's crazy that something like a Walmart gift card is printed on plastic, but our social security cards are printed on the flimsiest, flimsiest piece of paper that you could ever find. I'm all confused. Have you ever you thought about these things? <sighs> some of y'all don't lay awake in bed long enough. <laughs> so think about some of these things. Ah, it just is. Uh, uh, just one more, just real quick, because Gary's sitting in here. Uh, some of you others, y'all probably play golf. Have you ever thought that the object of, of golf, the object of golf is to play the least golf? It, everything, the faster you get done, the better you are. You ever thought? Yeah. I'm just saying, you ever thought about these things? Uh, this morning, I want to preach a message that's just titled this. Have you thought about it? Have you thought about it? And so we, we see here in this passage of Scripture, we, sometimes we read Scripture and we just kind of go with it, right? We read Scripture, we just kind of mull over it. It's really not something that we're going to sit there and really dig through. We just kind of head it and move on. But here this morning, this simple verse that really just seems so innocent is actually cram-packed. <laughs> This, this one verse with really almost a comma or a semicolon based on the translation that you have is really packed full of who God is and what God wants from us as the body of Christ. As a Christian, who we are supposed to be. And it just says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I mean, just straightforward almost, right? Just kind of goes... The thing, though, that we really have to do here is make sure that we're reading it the right way. You do realize that sometimes you can read and you skip a word because your eyes don't see it. And you can skip right over and before you know it, you've read the wrong thing. You ever took the wrong turn because you looked at it and you thought it said one thing and yet it said another? Yeah? Of course you haven't. But I'm just saying that these things do happen. They do happen. It does not say this. Are you ready? Verse 24 does not say, consider how to love each other and do good works. Now think about that for a second. It does not say, consider how to love each other and do good works. Now that is a good Christian principle. That is a good thing to do. I'm not saying that that's wrong, but it's not this verse. 
I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do, but it's not this verse. This verse is really particular. This verse really calls us out. And so we think about these, how to consider how to love each other and do good works, even though it's not right. It's a Christian-based thing. And it's okay to do that. It's not wrong. We're to love each other. Jesus says that's how people will know that you're my disciples, by how you love one another. You know, you, you look at John 13, 34, and 35, and that's what he tells them. How you love each other, this world will know that you love me. You're my disciples. You walk with me. We're to do good works. We realize that. We can read what James says, faith without works is dead. We are to do good works. There, there are things that we're called out to do. And so when you look at James chapter 2, verse 17, you, you see this. But Hebrews 10, 24 is different. There's more to it than just us doing something as far as love and good works. It, it goes just so much deeper in the sense of it. And so it tells us here in Hebrews 10, 24, consider, consider how to stir. I don't know about you, but just for a second. There is a certain way to mix flour and milk and eggs. You ever thought about that? I didn't think about it. <laughs> just saying, right? Do I ever think about that? Absolutely not. So just, just real quick. <clears throat> My brain does not go the way that you're supposed to stir. Are you supposed to mix in flour and water? Or, or flour, what, whatever you use. I don't know. I don't know. I don't cook. You see how good I am. Anyway, that's the reason it don't work. I'm just, ev I'm everywhere, right? I'm ever I know there's a certain way you're supposed to do it. Not me. I'm up, down, side. Up. It's like painting, right? You don't paint that way either. My mind works that way, right? That's, that's how I work. Amanda saw me mowing the yard, and Madison was sitting beside her one day. Just real quick, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you. Mowing the yard, and all of a sudden, they're looking at me, and I'm mowing the yard. And Amanda looked over at Madison and said, what is he doing? He's everywhere. <laughs> and Madison, just as calmly as normal, looks at her and says, that's how his brain works. Is exactly how he's mowing. <laughs> <That's his> <laughs> <laughs> Here in Scripture, there's a part of we, we've got to discipline ourselves to consider. Consider is a deep word. Consider is something that doesn't happen in five seconds. And so it says, consider how to stir. So when we look at that word, consider, we've got to think about this. Are we considering others? That means that they would be before ourselves. Now that, contrary to the world, contrary to most things, right, contrary to the flesh, Consider how to start. This consider. Philippians 2 verse 3 says this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Now think about that for a second. Think about that. When we get to this part and it says but in humility count others. The King James Version would use a word called esteem. Esteem others. Right? Above yourself. Well, when you really get to it, the, the word is still this, consider. Consider others better than yourself. There is a part of being a Christian that is no longer about me. Right? Isn't that what Zach said? It, it's not, a, really, it's not about what somebody thinks of us. It is about what God thinks of us, what he thinks of us. And then when what he thinks of us, now all of a sudden we die out to self and now we consider others. The scripture is clear all the way through. Jesus was the example, right? Jesus did the whole thing. He should have been served, yet he was the one serving. Now, it comes into play here in the church. All of a sudden, the scripture says in Hebrews 10, 24, that we've got to consider. We've got to consider the things that really need to happen. We really need to count what's getting ready to be. See, that's why it says consider how to stir up one another. So really, you got to look at it this way. Are you ready? We look at it this way, even though it's tough. When it says 
consider how to stir up one another, it means this. you got to look at one another. I ain't got no clue about you unless I'm looking at you. Consider how to stir someone. Think about one another. Come on. You got to think. If I'm not thinking about you, then I ain't got no clue what I need to do. Right? Focus on one another. Listen, we spend more time in the mirror. Focusing, focusing on ourselves. All scripture says, die out the self. It ain't about you. Consider others. Others. Consider. <laughs> Study one another. Ooh. You ever been sitting somewhere and it's just like, and you turn around, somebody's going, and now what? And they don't go, <laughs> they just keep doing it. You know what they're doing? Studying. They could be in a trance, but more than likely, they're studying. <laughs> they're studying, they're looking at the person. Because they're trying to figure out things or trying to see things, right? They're, they're going to study what's happening right there. This word consider means that we take time. There's a time aspect that all of a sudden, instead of focusing on self, now all of a sudden it becomes we discipline ourselves to focus on somebody else. We think about others. Study other people. You see, even to go this far. Letting your mind be occupied with one another. Think about it. Letting your mind be occupied with one another. How often do you think about somebody in church? Outside of these four walls. How often? The second is this. I'm almost done. <laughs> Maybe. Second is this. Not just considering one another, now watch this, not just considering one another, but now considering how to stir up one another. Now we've had to think about people, but after you think about people, now there's something that's got to happen. After you studied someone, after you looked at someone, after someone's occupied your mind, now there's even something else that you got to do based on this scripture. Based on this scripture, not only do you consider, think about, be occupied with, do these whole things, now you've got to figure out how to stir. How to stir. <laughs> For me, it's really what a thing to try to comprehend. Because some people don't like to be stirred. <laughs> some people don't like the stirring aspect. Some people don't like the way we stir. You come to my kitchen, the way I stir is probably not going to be right. If I came to your kitchen, it'd still be wrong. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> just start. But as I... It's going to take focus. Just bear with me for just a moment. It will take people focusing on each other before you actually know what somebody needs. You can't just guess. You can't always just ask. Because if you ask, you know what most people are going to say? I don't need anything. You must not have asked anybody lately, right? That's what most people say. Most people are like, I'm good, right? Good, don't need anything. You've got to study somebody. You've got to look at, and then you will be able to focus. And when you do that, to actually have to think about people that come to church. Now watch this. Not just church day, but to think about people that come to church is something that you've got to discipline your mind to do. Because Satan is trying to get you to focus on the worldly aspect. The things that you have to do. He wants you to focus on your job. He wants you to focus on your money. He wants you to focus on these things. He's always going to. Because scripture tells us we are to consider how to stir up one another. Scripture tells us we're to focus on one another. Scripture tells us we're to think about each other. Not just on Sunday. It's something, what? It's something that's a foreign concept too many times to too many people. That when we walk out the doors we forget everything that happened. And that's not scriptural. 
But we've got to understand that as we read verse 24, now just for a second, you've got a verse 25. And the reason you have verse 25 is because you've got a verse 24. And then verse 24 leads to verse 25. And then when you get to verse 25, then you understand verse 24. Now, are you with me or are you all confused? <laughs> you see, if you read verse 25, it's interesting what it says. And do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some have. A lot of times we wonder, why is that so important? Because people didn't read verse 24. Can I, can I, just for a second, now I understand today's a little bit different. They're calling for bad weather. Things are going, I understand that concept. But then again, <clears throat> now I'm just, I'm just saying, just as COVID, you can't use COVID till the day you die to say the reason you don't come to church. Just like you can't, you, listen, somebody's always going to be sick. Weather's always going to happen. Things are going to take place. And so then we can't always use something as a crutch, the reason that we don't do verse 25. Now, watch this. You know what's hardest for the people that obey and do verse 25? It's too many times we get focused on the ones that are not doing verse 25. And you forget about the people that do do verse 25. And you forget. Now, watch this. Now, I'm just saying. Sometimes you forget that the people that are here are struggling just as much. And if we're not stirring up the people that are willing to come, they won't come either. Now, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Now, I'm not going to beat that dead horse for very long. But I'm saying this, it's hard to stir somebody up that don't meet. I'll just tell you, it's hard to focus and think and look and see what's going on in somebody's life. If you don't see them, if, you don't, if they're not here, if they're not together, it is hard to do. That's the reason he says this. To be able to do that verse 24, verse 25 has got to happen. And that's the reason the writer says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Because the way that the church thrives is that we look at one another and we realize if somebody actually has something going on. And we want to meet that need. Too many times, watch, too many times people will lay out and then wonder why the church hadn't taken care of the need. Well, we don't know. We ain't seen it. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get that somebody that never told me they were sick and then were upset because I didn't come visit. I can't. If I don't see the need, I don't know. There's got to be something that happens. And forsaking the assembling of each other makes it hard to stir somebody up. Because we're called to stir. And so now I want to get back to that just real quick. <clears throat> Don't focus. Now, just one second. I'm just going to say this again. Don't continually focus on the people that are not here because then you miss the people that are. Now listen, I realize some people miss for good reasons and they need to be visited, they need to be came. But listen to me, if they've been gone for 27 years, quit focusing on them because you're missing everybody else that God sends. Now if you're upset about that, take somebody the recording, let them watch it and they can be upset with you. But it was, I'm just saying, man, we've got to figure out how to stir one another up to love and good works because that's what the scripture calls us to. We've got to think about these things ponder on these things, but then it says we've got to act on these things. So now, the things that we've got to act on is this. How can we help others become more loving? Now think about this. Now ain't nobody walking around that says, well, I'm just not loving. I love everybody. And yet the scripture says this. Think about, consider how to stir somebody up to even doing more love. Now if somebody thinks that they're loving enough and you're trying to stir them up, most of the time they're going to get upset because they're saying, well, you think that I'm not loving enough. Well, no, we're just trying to sit back, we're focusing and we're saying, hey, how can we even get more love coming out of who we are? Listen, this is all of us, not just one or two or whatever. Every, this is a call to Christians. It's a call to who we are. This is our job is to focus on one another because we want to see each other living to the potential of what God wants us to live to. And this thing of encourage, we always, now watch, people say they want to be an encouragement, but my thing is this, how much have you focused and looked at someone to be able to be an encouragement? Just saying a word or two is not the key. This is the key. 
We've got to consider how to stir people up to love and good works. Don't just say something to them, we missed you, we did this. No, no, it's got to be more to it. There's something that has to happen. How can we help others do even more good works than what they're already doing? One of the greatest things to consider in the church is how to get people involved. I had amen after that. I'm just joking. But I'm just, I want you, it is. The hardest thing in church is going, now watch this, is to get people involved. You know how I know that's true, Tony? Somebody made an announcement again about nursery workers, Sunday school teachers, helpers for whatever in any area of whatever area. Now, watch this. I'm just telling you. The hardest thing to do is get people involved in church. If we, now, I'll just tell you this because I've seen it. You go outside, get a sports game going on, your child's involved in there, your, your spouse is involved in something. I'll tell you what, people volunteer like crazy. They will run themselves ragged for the world. I had a man after that one too. I didn't have a run. I'm just joking. <laughs> so if, man, y'all need to loosen up. <laughs> By the way, you know it's true. You just don't know what to do with it. You're afraid somebody's going to get upset if you say amen, which means so be it. It's okay to say amen, and actually, who cares if they get upset? It's fine. If the truth is the truth, you let it go. But the thing is this. How do we start? How do we get people involved? How do we stir people up to this sense? How do we get people to realize in church that, hey, these things have to happen? Not just my job, the board's job, the Sunday school teacher's job, the secretary's job, the treasurer's job, whatever it is. It's everybody. We're all to consider each other. Right? You, what? I can't consider myself. Or, or, I can't consider you above me, but then everybody else just has to be below. Consider all. Everybody, right? So we're here. Everybody else is here. It changes now your outlook, your focus, everything that has to happen because now you are concerned about other people. Why do you think Jesus' ministry was moving in the way that it did? Because he always focused on somebody else. He always saw the need. Why? Because he watched. He saw what was happening. Watch what he does. He goes on the Sea of Galilee, and as he's coming across, man, they ain't got no food. 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. How many people you want to put there? It says he goes across. You remember what it says? He says he looked upon a focus, not of himself, because he's already wore out. Read the scripture. A focus of himself that as he goes across, he says he has compassion on them because they looked as sheep without a shepherd. The only way he can know that is if he focused on them. If he looked at them. If he really knew what was going on. And then if he says, not my will, but your will be done. I've got to be put aside. I've got to put everybody else up. And then I will realize really what's happening here. Jesus was the greatest example. And we, now what? We are to be little Christ. Right? That's what we're called to be. So we want to be the example of him. Now the thing of it is, how do we do that? How do we stir people up? Jesus stirred his disciples up. He would speak to them and draw them in and tell them the things that they needed. And man, here it is. He would take Peter, James, and John further and he took the rest of them to stir them just a little bit more. Come on. Stir them just a little bit deeper. Go to the Mount of Transfiguration. Even though they struggled staying awake there too. All these things. Jesus took them a little bit further because he wanted to stir them. Who are you stirring this morning? Who are you stirring? Whew. Now, real quick, here's, here's what we've got to go to because we, we've got to grasp this concept. Whew. Are you ready? <laughs> Lost people, which is non-Christians, now watch, can love and do good works. Now watch. Someone who is not right with the Lord can love and do good works. The world is full of people trying to fill their void of Jesus with love and good works. They're trying to do these things because Satan is trying to mimic who Jesus is. Now, he can because Satan can't fill the void with all the things that he can promise and offer, right? And so we see this sense of, man, 
There are people, now what? James, you told me before. He said one of the hardest things for him to get saved was, he says, I wasn't a bad person. He couldn't figure out why he needed Jesus. He was morally good. He wasn't going to do anything wrong. He wasn't going to lie, cheat, or steal. Can I tell you, those are the hardest people to get right with the Lord because they say, why do I? I'm doing the same thing you're doing. Right? Now, come on. But the writer deals with it. He deals with it before we get to verse 24. So when you go all the way back up to verse 19, he comes in and he starts to talk about this. The only way, now watch this, he says the only way, the full assurance that we have of salvation is through the blood. We can enter into that holy of holies now because now the veil is torn. Now this is what he's saying all the way down through there, 19 to 23, to get to verse 24 and 25, what that means. And so he gets to this place and he says, hey, everybody just can't say they, they love and do good works and call themselves a Christian. He says, you got to be bought with the blood of the lamb now what when you're bought with the blood of the lamb now what you don't do good works and love people to try to fill a void you do love and good works because you realize that's who Jesus is and whoever Jesus is is who we want to be and so we don't try to mimic something in a sense of nothing that can ever feel. But what we say is this, man, my life has been transformed. I don't even think the same anymore. And I realize what Jesus did and how he put others first. And man, God blessed his ministry. And other people we have watched and seen that they put other people first and God blesses them. And all of a sudden we realize, hey, scripture is true. We need to do this. We've got to consider other people, how to stir them up to love and good works. Because we just can't come by. What? We just can't and say, I missed you. I'm just telling you, it ain't good enough. I'll tell you this. It ain't good enough for the pastor to be the one that always visits and calls. It really does nothing. I just want you to know straight up. People will complain that because I haven't called or visited, but that ain't the issue. If you really want to get down to the issue, they don't want to hurt your feelings. It's because you hadn't called and you hadn't visited. It's because the people they've been with the most didn't even realize that they weren't here. Now, if you really want to get down to it, it ain't me. I've only been here four years. How long have you been here? Oh, boy. Oh, sorry. I didn't have amen after that because I didn't have that road down either. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, listen, what are you considering? What are you considering? How much do you focus on somebody? How much can you look at them? Now, I... Not in the judgmental sense, because we're talking about a Christian looking at a Christian. You're talking, now what? You're talking about looking at somebody and saying, you know what? How can I get James more involved in the things of God? Because if he's more involved in the things of God, then more love is just going to flow out of him because he's doing the things of God. He, he realizes that, man, this is the place to be. This is the thing to do. This is the best thing that needs to happen for my life. And so we begin to look at these things and we try to realize, how does this work? Listen, the lost can't do it. The lost is not what, now why? The lost is not going to be what causes your church to thrive. Because I'll tell you this, from the beginning of time, lost people have put tons of money in the church and yet the church still is bankrupt most of the time. Watch, God doesn't bless it in the sense of, oh, a sinner put money in, I'll bless it. No, 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 no. If you're not right with the Lord, put in all the money you want to, it don't matter. God loves a cheerful giver in the sense of, hey, the reason I give a dollar or I give $20 million is because I love Jesus. Now watch this. Outside of being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, you can put your tied money into your blue in the face, and it won't do a bit of good. Just saying. Now watch this. Ooh, help me, Lord. Whew. You cannot put your tithe money in and say that you love God till you're blue in the face and you open up the book of Malachi and all of a sudden it slapped you in the face. <laughs> now what? Don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger of what the word says. So now listen. You say, Pastor, what are you trying to say? The key point is not money. The key point is Jesus. Oh, I just, I, that's what I'm getting to. Don't get caught up on, well, pastor said, well, pastor said, it came from here. So if you got a problem with it, you got to go here first, then come talk to me, and we can settle whatever needs to be done through the Holy Spirit. I don't want to do anything in the flesh. 
Just telling you this. You come and talk to me, it ain't going to be done in the flesh because I don't want to live in the flesh. We're going to do things spiritual. We're going to do things spiritual. We're going to do things spiritual. Because, let's what? Too many churches have been divided because people got in the flesh instead of in the spirit. Woo! Boy, that's good preaching. Anyway, so here we go. Now, that was just a sidetrack for just a second because I'm just, I'm, I'm wanting us to grab hold here. As he deals with this whole aspect of sin issue of not knowing Jesus in 19 through 23. And actually the only way that we get to heaven, the scripture says, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. We believe on that by faith that he saved us from our sins and cleansed us. And man, things begin to happen and we understand that, man, this is some awesome things that are happening in our lives. And then we get to this next part and he says this, you know, we, we get down here in verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You say, Pastor, what's the answer? I don't know all the answers. Now watch it. You say, well, Pastor, how come you don't know all the answers? Because <laughs> I can't get to everybody. Now watch this. You do realize that the Lord uses you to stir up somebody else to love and good works. and ain't just my job. Right. And all of a sudden, when the church begins to focus on the church the way it needs. Now watch it. The way it needs to. Not doing this. Well, that's just a minute. And that, well, that dress is just the worst dress. That, well, I don't know why they wore that tie. I thought it matched. So anyway, but that, what I'm saying is this. When we focus on people with, now watch this, with the attitude and the right motive of saying, how can I help them get closer to Jesus? It changes the atmosphere of the church. And so when I come and, and say, hey, wh what would you like to get more involved in? Lord wants to use you. And you say, uh, I'd like to get involved in, let's just say this, ready? Uh, I want to get involved more in singing. Well, I'm sorry, you can't do that. Now what? we got to be careful in the way we do things. Even I as a pastor have to be careful. But I want you to know that the Bible is also specific in some of the things people can and cannot do. And we have to be very careful as a church. Can I just give you an instance real quick? Scripture says, do not put a new convert in leadership unless they be led astray and go back into the way that they are. So just because somebody gets saved does not mean that they're on the board next week. Just saying. Just because somebody gets saved doesn't mean that they're teaching Sunday school next week. I want you to realize somebody gets saved, now there's a proving time that they're doing this. Now watch, inside that proving time, it's going to prove who the church is as well. Because are we looking at that person that got saved to be able to focus upon them, to see what they need, to be able to stir them to love and good works. Instead of looking the other way and just saying, well, they got saved, let's go to the next one. Because if you go to the next one, now you missed out on this one. we got to stay focused. On what the Lord has given to us so that we know how to stir people up to the thing that they need. Now watch this. Somebody comes and gets saved. Let's just go back to the new convert. Somebody gets saved and all of a sudden we realize they got saved. Now watch this. All of a sudden Pastor Sam is focusing on somebody. You got that look, right? Looks into your soul. <laughs> Pastor Sam starts to look at somebody and says this. You know what? <clears throat> Man, I need to stir them up, maybe, maybe to discipleship. Oh, now what? What? You didn't put them in a place of leadership. You're not putting them in a place that's going to probably cause them harm. You're actually saying this. I, I want to be able to walk with them, to be able to stir them up. And the way to do that is getting into discipleship and talking about the word and encouraging one another. And all of a sudden you see this pot stirring. And you see things happening. And man, all of a sudden, in private times of conversation and prayer, you see that the love of God is being stirred more in their life. You see that all of a sudden now there's this desire to do more good works for Him. And when you begin to see that, all of a sudden we look back and we say, Hey, now that is what the church is supposed to be. But you say, how is that going to be for everybody? Well, discipleship is for everybody, but the sense of it is this. We've got to get to the place to where we're able through you, 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 right? You, 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 you. Now, that's in Christ. All of a sudden, we look at it, and we say we need to focus on one another to figure out how to make sure that we're stirred enough because once it quits getting stirred, the church starts to die. And the last thing I think anybody really would actually say and admit is that they want to be part of a dead church. Uh, alive in an active church? 
is the one that's focusing, saying, hey, how can we get them closer? How can we get them closer? So my question this morning on a Sunday morning is this. Who have you been focusing on? Who have you seen? Who have you helped? What really has been your sin? Is your Christian life based on you or is it based on others? Well, what have you done this year? It's January. We're already to the 16th day of January, right? Halfway through the month. Now, my question is this. We have all these goals that we're going to do because we have all these great intentions leading up to January that we should have done in February of last year, but we waited till January of this year. <laughs> ah. Anyway, you get to this point and you realize, hey, all these things are good, but am I even focusing on anybody? <laughs> Because New Year's resolutions are great until you realize they're all about yourself. And Scripture says it can't all be about you. It's got to be about others. And all of a sudden we step back and we say, what have I done in 16 days that has benefited somebody else spiritually? How have I helped stir, as Scripture would tell us to? How have I considered, pondered, thought about to stir somebody up to love and good works what have we done to see them grow in jesus see here's the thing that i believe the lord really wants us to grab hold of this morning is this if we expect one or two people to do the stirring the church ain't gonna be around much If we expect just one or two people to step up and say, well, we're really going to push for this or do this or I feel like the Lord's leading me. The thing of it is if you're in tune with the Lord and you've been praying, he's already led you to something. I preached on that Sunday night. But the thing is this. Who are you stirring? Who are you stirring? Because I, I want you to know, just, can I just give you myself here? I'll just give you myself. I know what it's like. I was talking to a guy on the phone that I'd known for quite a few years. Lives a long ways away. And I, I remember I told you about that. I called him up just to ask him a question about something and ended up, uh, we were talking about the Lord and going to, man, isn't that great? So anyway, we, we do that and we talk for a while. And before we got off the phone, he said that he had no clue what my week had been like. He didn't know what two nights of this past week had been like for me. He had no clue. No clue. And yet somehow in the midst of his prayer time and focusing on the Lord but also on others, there was this sense of he realized some stirring needed to happen in me. Well, you pastor, you need stirring, you better believe it. <laughs> And he, and he told me something like this. He said, I just want to let you know. He said, I wanted to tell you how much I appreciate the impact and the influence that you had on my wife when you all worked together. He said, uh, she tells everybody about the witness that you were to her. He didn't realize how much encouragement I needed through that stirring. You realize life gets hard sometimes even for the Christian. And Hebrews 10, 24 is there for a reason because life is hard. And the body of Christ needs each other. And the Lord calls us out. You want to come on up and play? The Lord calls us out. And he says this. Consider. Consider how to stir up. Consider how to stir up. Consider how to encourage Consider how to lead. Consider how to get them to love Jesus more. We know they love. Now watch this. Why, you can meet people and you know that they love Jesus. But I want you to realize there's still more to love. Still more to go. Man, the Holy Spirit always deals with us to get us closer to him. What falling more in love with Jesus? The song says this. The longer I serve him. Now watch this. Can I tell you that was, now what? We've kind of got away from that in the last 20 years. But I want you to know that that song is true. You know why that song is true? 
Because there was something about the community of the church of the faith that came together and they saw each other and they stirred each other up. And they realized that this, this path, see me and you preachers, right brother? And so there's this thing that you can look, right? You can focus. Not that you call out any one thing, but what you do is you come in and you say, how can I stir up love and good works in your life? Listen to me. God puts people in our lives and in your life because you need to focus on them. You need to help them out. You need to stir them to love and good works. I wonder even this morning, even this morning, we don't want to see anyone lost. We don't want to see anyone miss it. But can I just go back for just a second? Jesus says this. They will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. What if someone here this morning does not know Jesus? What if someone here this morning doesn't know Jesus, but they know the history of the church? They know everything about everything. Can I tell you, man, Satan is good at what he does. And he'll bring up the worst of the worst of whatever happened in the past. Just so that nothing could happen in the future. But I wondered this morning. Maybe are we stirring one another up that they could even look at us. And they would know that we are his disciples by how much we love each other. Can I tell you people take note of how the church actually lives. And the church wants to know if the church actually cares about the church. If the church really looks at one another and not always beating somebody down or talking behind their back or gossiping about them, but the church comes together and say, you know, what can I do to actually stir you up to get you closer to Jesus? I'm not saying that you're living in sin, not saying that. I'm just saying, man, he's dealt with me, and let's just get closer to Jesus. Because I can also tell you what will happen in our own personal lives as you do that. Now watch, as you are focusing on others to see how they can get closer to the Lord. Watch this. All of a sudden, the Lord blesses that, and now he begins to pour out something on you because you're going to need something if you're willing to give it out. Jesus would, now watch this. Jesus was willing to always give it out, but the Father always gave him what he needed. Now listen, if you ain't been with the Father, you ain't going to have what you needed. And if you ain't been with the Father, it's hard to focus on people and to see what we really need in their life to be able to lead them in the right direction. But I'll tell you, there is something about the body of Christ when they get in tune in prayer, in tune with the Lord, in tune with each other, and you focus on one another. We don't beat each other down. We actually lift each other up. And the church becomes the church in the way that he said, hey, this is what needs to happen. Now watch this. Watch this. I believe what can happen is this. I believe because of verse 24, there's really not going to be that much of a need for verse 25 to be talked about that much. Because when people fall in love with Jesus and they're fall, now what, following him and they see the church loving on each other like a church, you ain't got to worry about people forsaking the assembling of each other because they want to get where people love them. They want to get where they know it's real. They want to get to a place to where they see these things and they're like, I love being part of that family because that family's real. You ever heard those things before? That's what we got to be. Can I ask you this? What have you done this week? What about this year? 16 days into it. Who have you stirred up? Who have you focused on? Have you only focused on the negative? Because if you only focus on the negative, I'll go ahead and tell you this. You ain't got no spiritual help whatsoever. Because as long as you focus on the negative, God can never get you what you need. You got what? You got to let go of that. Focus on what's positive. That way, God can fill you up in the way that you need to be filled up. Who are you focused on as you stand this morning?